Chapter 18 They found his body next morning, caught in a tree at a bend in the river about a mile down. The sheriff and Brother Whitley had looked for him along the river all night, in the hope that he'd been able to grab a tree limb or something and hang on. I could have told them he wouldn't have been able to do that. It just wasn't a possibility. But I was out of commission myself until about the middle of the next day. Mercifully, I have never been able to remember anything else that happened that night. Artists told me about it later. When Brother Whitley had found the note I'd left, all his instincts told him something was wrong. He called the sheriff, and they got together what amounted to a posse, I suppose, and drove to River House by the same roundabout way I'd taken. They found me down by the river, alone, Artis said. I was kicking off my shoes, about to dive in myself, and according to Artis, it took two men to stop me, because I kept fighting them and yelling that Nathan was drowning. My mouth twists now to think I was disposed to be so heroic as though it would have done Nathan one bit of good at that point. Anyway, one guy in the posse was a doctor, and he gave me a sedative, and somebody else drove me back to the parsonage and put me to bed on the couch in Brother Whitley's study. And that was where I woke up the next morning, lying there dull and stunned and listening to the sounds I could hear in the rest of the house, low, hopeless sobbing that I thought was Mrs. Whitley, Brother Whitley's tired voice, a steady murmur of people, the doorbell ringing, and an old man's voice telling someone at the front door, No, there ain't no services this morning. Preacher's boy's been drowned. Because it was Sunday, all the churchgoers ended up at the parsonage instead of the church, offering their condolences. People being there is what I remember most about the days just before and after Nathan's funeral. People filling the kitchen with food, trying to get Mrs. Whitley to eat, listening to Brother Whitley tell what happened over and over, as if he'd eventually be able to believe it. Everything else is blurred with the numbness I felt at the time. Paige came to the house, and I remember holding her while she sobbed sharply, bitterly, in a rage of grief. I don't remember seeing Artis cry, except at the funeral, but her eyes were always red. The family's relatives arrived, aunts and uncles. They stayed at a motel in Kirbyville, but hung out at the parsonage. I especially remember old Mrs. Whitley, Nathan's grandmother, silent and stoic in her grief. Monday afternoon we went to the funeral home so the family could receive people there. This was new and strange to me, what you did when somebody died. I didn't understand the point of viewing the person in his casket, for instance, but everyone else did, so I did too. Nathan's stillness impressed me the most. I had never seen anyone dead, and I noticed little things. They brushed his hair too neatly, left his mouth too pale. I knew, of course, that it wasn't really him any more. Even then, I didn't have trouble with the metaphysics of it, the separation of his spirit from the body he no longer needed. But the swiftness with which this had all come about kept me staring at him, marveling at that leftover frame which had been so vital, so essential, just days before. I looked at his big, still hands, the left one folded over the right. My own hand came up, and with the tips of my fingers I touched the tips of his to feel the faint, rough dance of his guitar calluses, still there, as if they meant anything any more. Even with that, I didn't feel as if I wanted to cry. I didn't cry at the funeral the next day, either, but everybody else did. The church was filled with weeping, not only Mrs. Whitley's broken sobbing, Paige's shattering grief, but quiet tears from almost everyone present. Even the guy who gave the eulogy, the district superintendent of the church, I think he was, faltered as he spoke. The organist wept while she played. Only I was dry-eyed. My eyes burned, but they didn't cry. I was a pallbearer, and I remember the terrible weight of that long, long casket. I remember Brother Whitley finally breaking down at the graveside during the last prayers, gusty, racking sobs that set everyone else crying again, except me. 
and I remember being stunned that we could walk away, leaving Nathan's body to be lowered into the soggy ground, knowing what would slowly happen to it there. But we did, because there was nothing else to do. After the funeral, I could sense a suspended peace, a relief. It was over, and we could breathe again for a while. Relatives and church members came back to the parsonage, and there was subdued talk and mountains of food. I saw both of Nathan's parents actually eating something. I ate, too, to keep my stomach from gnawing. I just drifted around, not thinking, my head tired and numb. Artists seemed to be doing the same thing. We'd pass each other every once in a while. Paige hadn't come to the house afterward. She'd hugged me hard at the graveside, shaking with sobs, before she'd pulled away and gone off with her parents. I didn't know if I would ever see her again. And I never saw Egan. I'd kept an eye out for him. I'd thought he might show up at the parsonage, the hypocrite, to pay his respects. But I should have known he wouldn't come anywhere near, not now. Brother Whitley talked to me that night after everyone left and basically asked me to stay with him as long as I wanted. I know it was going to be a couple more weeks before you and... He stopped and swallowed. Before you were supposed to fly out of here. And the new custodian can't start until then, so we still need you at the church if you would. But it would be a comfort to Elaine and Artis and me, too just to keep you around for a while. I was glad they wanted me. Part of me felt desperate to get out of there, to run away. But if they needed me, I'd stay. It was something I could do for Nathan, sort of in remembrance of him. I said I would stay until the date on my return ticket. For a while, there was some gossip about what had happened to Nathan. Artists told me so later. Not that anybody thought I'd pushed him into the river or that I hadn't tried my best to save him. But people wondered if he'd jumped in himself, committed suicide. Why else would he have been down by the river at night, with the water at flood stage? Nobody really knew what had gone on down there just before he drowned, and everybody figured I was the only one who did. To a certain extent, I told Brother Whitley and the sheriff the truth that Nathan and I had gone down there to talk, and that I was trying to persuade him to come home when he slipped. But I left out the part about Nathan's hands letting go of me before I'd lost my hold on him. I still didn't want to think about what that meant. I told myself that maybe he'd gone into cardiac arrest. Weeks of not eating or sleeping had surely weakened his heart. I couldn't bring myself to believe he had let go of me on purpose when he'd heard Egan coming. And I also said that Egan Kautz had not been out there, that he'd stayed inside River House the whole time and had had nothing to do with me and Nathan that night. I lied about that simply because I wasn't sure what had happened just before I lost hold of Nate, and I feared what Egan might do if anybody went out there to question him. Besides, I knew I could never make anybody believe what I understood about the river man and what he had done to Nathan that summer. After the funeral, things started to emerge a little more clearly from the fog I'd lived in just after Nathan's death. Nothing got easier. It was more like changing to a sharper, more focused nightmare. Strange as it sounds, I kept sleeping upstairs in Nate's room. I couldn't go on camping in Brother Whitley's study downstairs. And I had the sense of taking care of things for Nathan, keeping his room from becoming a lonely shrine. I felt better there than anywhere else. That didn't mean sleeping was easy. I could fall asleep, but then I would have terrible dreams, one shifting into another. One common theme was Nathan lost and me trying to find him. Another was that we had buried him alive, and once I even dreamed that Egan had dug him back up for what horrible purpose I couldn't find out. The worst one was that it had all been an awful mistake. Nathan hadn't died after all. He'd look around the door at me and say, Hey, Tim. And such relief would flood me. How silly we'd all been to think he was dead. And then I would wake up in the darkness, and that was probably as close as I ever came to crying, although I never did. Still, staying in Nathan's room was a lot easier than cleaning at the church. There I saw Nate everywhere, remembered things he'd said, 
and slowly I started to believe he wasn't coming back. Exactly where he had gone, I never contemplated. I knew that leftover body in the ground wasn't him any more, but I didn't spend much time thinking about where the real him was. I had rejected the typical ideas about heaven years ago, people turning into angels, sitting around on clouds playing harps. Nathan would have hated being an angel, too much responsibility. I didn't exactly not believe he still existed. It was just too much for my stunned imagination right after he died. He'd lost the battle, and that was that. He was gone. The hot days felt even hotter because of the moisture steaming up from the rain-soaked ground. Artis and I stayed home, mostly, and she stuck close to Mrs. Whitley, who rarely came out of the bedroom. When she did, she fumbled her way along, asked a few vague questions about the household, and went back to her room. Artis would take meals to her, coax her into the shower, things like that. Brother Whitley kept going at top speed, making house and hospital calls, packing his days with work. The bishop had offered to send an interim minister to take over for a while, but Brother Whitley wouldn't hear of it. I didn't blame him. Working helped me, too. When I wasn't at the church, I helped artists run the house, cleaning and doing laundry and warming up the casseroles people had brought. She and I formed a silent bond. We never talked much, but we were a team, and we knew it. Every once in a while, we would go into each other's arms, in the middle of the kitchen or whatever, without saying a word. I took strength from hugging that small, sturdy frame, and I could only hope that holding on to me gave her the same comfort. Once Brother Whitley walked in and saw us, he only looked at us with a sort of sad understanding and went out again. When the casseroles ran out, I started going to the grocery. It was then, my first time back in the station wagon, that I even remembered the food and sodas I'd stashed as part of my pathetic attempt to kidnap Nathan. Whoever had driven the station wagon back from River House that awful night had thoughtfully carried in my duffel bag and guitar, but left the food and cokes behind the front seat. I just gritted my teeth and brought them in with the rest of the groceries. Artis and I even drank some of the cokes that night while we tried to watch TV. But that was when I started to get angry, when I saw that pitiful stash of food, Nathan dead and buried, but the chips and coke still waiting, a reminder of my futile plan that had never had a rat's chance. My anger simmered all the next day as I worked over at the church, slamming things around. I tried to burn off my fury by straightening the storage closet where the vacuum cleaner stayed. And that damn black spade was not in there. I dragged everything out to make sure. Somehow its absence made me angrier than ever. At last I went into the sanctuary and sat for a while. I didn't know why. I just didn't want to go back to the parsonage, and I didn't want to go driving around because then I would miss Nathan more. He was one of the objects of my fury because he'd been so stubborn, so wrong-headed, and at the end so weak. "'Why'd you let go, Nate?' I yelled at him in my head. "'You dumb shit! Why didn't you hang on? Why aren't you here now, helping me make sense of all this?' Then I was also angry at Egan, but I'd been angry at Egan for weeks, watching how he treated Nathan. I'd already known he was the devil guy, doing his devil guy thing. I couldn't get any madder at Egan than I'd already been.' And I knew he hadn't made Nathan let go and be drowned. He hadn't wanted that any more than I had. No, the one I was really mad at was God. You could have fixed this, I raged as I sat there in the light from the stained glass windows. I prayed to you. I asked you to help Nathan. And you sat up there and let pure dumb luck take over. And Nathan gave up. For a long time I sat in a funk of anger and despair, Nathan dead and the rest of us miserable, and no way that could be fixed, and worst of all, God so remote and uncaring. I'd been so sure God would get us through this, hadn't I? Or had I been as faithless as Nathan, never really believing that God loved him and would take care of him? Presently a small figure came through one of the side doors at the head of the sanctuary. It was Paige. 
As she passed through a bar of light, filtering through red-stained glass, her hair turned to ruby. "'Hi, Tim,' she said, coming down the center aisle to where I sat. "'Brother Whitley said you might be in here.' "'Hey,' I said. She sat beside me in the pew, and I turned toward her and settled myself so I could see her face. It looked puffy, as if she'd been crying, but she looked back at me steadily enough. "'I came to see how you were doing,' she said. "'I'm okay. I felt a pang of remorse. How have you been? I'm sorry I haven't come around to see you, or—' "'Oh, that's okay. You've been helping artists. I just talked to her over at the house, and she says her mom's not doing too well.' I shook my head. Stays in her room. Cries a lot, I guess. Yeah, Paige swallowed. You two have had your hands full. I shrugged and nodded, and we sat for a few minutes without speaking, letting the quiet of the sanctuary shimmer around us. Then she asked, Have you seen Egan? No, and I don't want to see him either. I just wondered, she said, what he's doing now. "'because my daddy said that River House isn't open any more. "'Really? "'You think he's still over there? "'Of course I'd wondered about Egan, but only fleetingly. "'It hadn't seemed to matter any more compared to Nathan's death. "'Now that somebody else had asked the question, I considered it. "'I don't know. "'Maybe he's moved on to greener pastures. "'Tim,' Paige's eyes were dark with pain, what really happened over there that night? So I gave her what I'd told Brother Whitley and the sheriff, that Nathan had been working hard for Egan, and I'd gone to see him, and we went down by the river, and I tried to get him to come home, and he slipped and fell in, and I couldn't hold on to him. The only thing I didn't tell her, besides leaving Egan out of it, was what I hadn't told Nate's father, my feeling that Nathan had deliberately let go of me. When I stopped talking, Paige was frowning. So nobody has seen Egan or talked to him? Nope. Why should we? Well, didn't Nate still have all his stuff at River House? His guitar and clothes and things? I stared at her. Jeez, I said, he sure did. You mean nobody ever went to get his things out of there? Hard to believe none of us had thought of that, but nobody had. It's all just been crazy, I told her helplessly. It's all just been sort of suspended, like he's going to come back pretty soon and... I know. And go get his own stuff, without us having to do it for him. I know, she said, and tears ran down her cheeks. I moved toward her, but I didn't want to put my arms around her, and I didn't think she wanted me to. Don't cry, Paige. Don't. Don't cry any more. I'll go get his things, okay? I'll go over there right now. I'll, I'll break in if I have to. Paige swiped at her cheeks and took a deep breath. You be careful, she told me. I will. She stood up and pulled a tissue out of the pocket of her shorts and blew her nose. Because you may have been right about Egan all along, she said. Maybe he is evil. Maybe he made Nathan drown. The evil part, yeah. But I don't think he killed Nathan. I don't think he wanted him dead. I followed her out of the pew, and we stood in the aisle for a minute and looked at each other. I thought she was still pondering Egan, but then she said, I can't believe that awful night at River House was the last time I ever saw Nathan alive. I just can't believe it. Then she went quickly out of the sanctuary, like she was hurrying somewhere to cry again. I stood looking at the stained glass window of Jesus holding a lamb, Something like a stone swelled in my chest until I wanted to tear it out and hurl it through the window. I could not understand why Nathan could not have been that lamb. Why it would have been any skin off God's nose for me to have pulled him out of the river. Well, I would at least get his guitar back. I could at least save that, provided Egan hadn't cleared out and taken everything with him. The first thing I looked for when I pulled up to River House was Egan's triumph. Sure enough, it sat at the side of the house, covered with dust. So he was still here. I went up the front steps, noticing that one of them had completely caved in, its jagged board sticking straight up. Several other boards on the porch looked about ready to go the same way. I pulled open the screen and tried the door. It was locked. 
Not bothering to think, I backed up, lifted my foot, and kicked straight in. The lock gave, and the door swung inward with a shutter. The main room was dark and stuffy. I moved slowly, expecting Egan to confront me any minute. But the silent emptiness never changed. As I passed the clutter of tables and chairs, the stage where Nathan had sat that last night, the bar with dirty glasses still on it. The back hall had a bad smell, like food rotting in the kitchen. At the foot of the stairs, I hesitated, feeling my hands go cold. Then anger swept through me again, warming me. I started up the steps. Halfway up, I could tell there were no lights on. I saw only the green afternoon gloom from the windows. I had nearly decided Egan must have left after all when I got to the top of the stairs and saw him. He sat on top of the work table by the far window, his knees drawn up to his chin, staring through the glass into the trees. He didn't notice me, so I stood for a minute to assimilate the sight of him. At first I thought his hair looked gray because of the greenish daylight. But a second look showed that it really was gray, a dull gray, like a rainy sky. It hung in strings around his face, which was all lines and wrinkles, his neck sagging. I could see his profile, and it was blurred, his chin pouchy. I could see his hands clearly, too, locked around his knees, gnarled and veiny. He looked at least seventy. Egan, I said. Slowly he turned his head toward me. His eyes were opaque, watery, and red-rimmed, the whites yellowish. When he spoke, his voice cracked as if he hadn't talked in days. What do you want? I came to get Nathan's things, his guitar and his clothes. Egan's eyes wandered to a corner. I followed his gaze and saw Nathan's guitar case and duffel bag. Fine. All I had to do was grab them and get out of here. Apparently Egan had no interest in me. But suddenly I couldn't let it end like that. I knew I couldn't settle any score with Egan for what he'd done to Nate. I was only human, and he so obviously wasn't. But I couldn't slink away, either. I looked around the studio where we'd all been so happy only a few weeks ago. The memories came back slowly, as if they were years old. Nathan on the couch with Paige, Nathan at the piano, working out vocals for me and Paige, Nathan serious in the booth, trying to please Egan. The stone swelled in my chest, cutting off my breath. Then my gaze fell on a flat white box. It was the master tape, a square box on the shelf behind the soundboard, marked N. Whitley, which preserved all of Nathan's finished music, his voice, his hard-working fingers. It glowed with sudden significance, and I knew what to do. I believe I'll just take this along, too, I said conversationally, going around behind the board. I didn't care if Egan zapped me dead. No way was I going off and leaving Nathan's music for him to destroy. But Egan did nothing. I eyed him as I picked up the box and swiped my fingers across the top to wipe off the dust. He watched me with a sort of narrow-eyed desperation, but he didn't move to stop me. Suddenly I knew he couldn't. He had no power over me any more. Yeah, I'll just be taking this with me. I stowed the tape in Nathan's duffel bag and closed the zipper over it firmly. You won't be needing it any more, will you, asshole? Your work's done. Egan kept looking at me. I saw the longing in his eyes. Yeah, he's gone now, I told him. You can't fuck with him any more. And as I said it, I knew it was true and felt a vicious satisfaction. Nathan was out of my reach, but by golly, he was also out of Egan's. No wonder Egan had howled like that down by the river. Where'd he go, Egan? I taunted him. Where is he now that you can't get to him? To my surprise, Egan shut his eyes and sucked in his breath in a long hiss like someone in pain. Bright, he said. What? I snapped. Bright? What's that mean? He's so bright. Egan's eyes were still closed, but the desperate wanting in his face told me he saw something I couldn't see, something he could never reach but only remember, 
maybe because all the old myths were true and he was a fallen angel after all. You can see him? I asked. You can see Nate? Brighter than ever, Egan said, and put his hands to his face and his head over on his knees. Then the rightness and the reason of it hit me at last, and I understood what had happened to Nathan. God came and got him, I said, to get him away from you. Except for a jerk of his shoulders when I said the name God, Egan didn't respond. There was no way out for him here, was there? You had him trapped. He was fighting, but you had him. I picked up Nathan's guitar and bag. But you weren't allowed to keep him, I said, and turned toward the stairs. I had my foot on the first step when I heard Egan say, Tim. For a second I was superstitious, afraid to look back before I remembered he couldn't hurt me. I turned my head to see Egan looking at me with a faint smile on his ravaged face. "'There'll always be somebody else,' he said. "'Yeah,' I thought. "'And whoever it is, God have mercy on him.' "'I drove carefully back to the parsonage, "'holding myself still as if I might break, "'afraid to think about what had happened, "'about what Egan had disclosed. "'Mechanically I parked and unloaded the guitar and duffel bag, "'carrying them up the steps, "'navigating them through the back porch door.' I met Brother Whitley on his way out. He stopped and looked at me, taking in the guitar and bag. I set the bag down and unzipped it. Here, I said, pulling out the flat square box. Here's Nathan's tape. It's all his music. It belongs to you now, and to Mrs. Whitley, an artist. For once, Brother Whitley was speechless. I went and got it from Egan's, I said. I could tell from Brother Whitley's face that he'd started to figure out the significance of the river man. His next words confirmed it. Tim, he said, his voice shaking, did that devil kill my son? Nathan wasn't killed, I told him. He was taken. Then I turned and went back out the door and across the yard and the gravel parking lot, faster and faster, until when I got to the field and the path leading down through it, I was pounding along, the stone breaking up in my chest now and threatening to spill. Halfway to the river, I stumbled and fell. As I sprawled in the path, breathing hard, the heat of the sun pressing on my back, the stone drained away and my breathing became sobbing, and at last I was able to cry. Not for Nathan, not now, but because I saw so clearly how it was all turned around. Nate, the free, living, bright one, after all, and Egan, forever shriveling and blackening against that brightness, and me, balanced on the edge in between them, doing it the hard way for another sixty years, pinned to the earth by the merciless weight of the sun. The stone has shut up my brain too soon. The seal is finally complete. Forgetting the rhyme and losing the tune with every darkening beat. And I'm heavy against the weight of the air and my colors are down to one. And I'm caught halfway to the top of the stair where night is never done. Close my eyes to see the stars and the light. Hear the mountains hum. Feel mercy's fingers closing tight to hush the weary drum. And now I'm sailing, sailing very still. And now I'm sailing out of gray. And morning's first bird, the last song from the hill before I sail away. This song, the last one, is the only one that I have never heard. I sit motionless after the ending chord fades, Nathan's consoling voice still in my ears, winding through my head. I know he must have written this in one final burst in those last desperate days at River House before he shut down completely. And the old puzzle comes back to haunt me, made sharp again by the song's lyrics. Did you know, Nate? Did you know what was going to happen to you? Did you let go on purpose that night, after all? I run the tape back and listen to the song again, 
and this time I end up smiling to myself, in spite of the tears on my face, as I realize that it doesn't much matter whether Nathan knew or not, because this is not a song about dying. This is a song about being rescued. <laughs> 